I fundamentally would disagree with anybody who would call China imperialist, just point to where there is a relationship of development and underdevelopment. We are living through times that are of immense confusion because the material basis of uh, Western capitalist imperialism is being called into question in a way that it hasn't before, right? And this can provide openings, I think, for, for a better, more sustainable world. Hello, everyone. I'm Rania Kalik, and this is Dispatches. Are Russia and China imperialists like the U.S.? Will the decline of the West lead to more fascism in the global North? What is sovereignty? Is every country entitled to it? Where do sanctions fit in? And what are the alternatives to the current so-called rules-based international order? To discuss this and more, I'm joined by Bikram Gill, who teaches at the Department of Political Science at Virginia Tech. But before we jump into it, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the bell so you get a notification whenever we post new content. And if you appreciate the show, you can help it grow by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash breakthrough news or by donating below on YouTube. So Vikram, welcome to Dispatches. It's so good to have you on. Uh, thanks, Rania. I'm happy to be here. So I'm really excited to have a really like wide ranging conversation to you about all things, you know, imperialism and sort of like international uh, policy and foreign policy. So let's start with the issue of imperialism, because, you know, sometimes I think for like a lot of the because you're in academia and you're surrounded by a lot of the sort of international relations type people, which can sometimes be the worst. Um, and a lot of times with them, imperialism is associated with like this bygone era of empire that no longer exists. It's like the past conquests that are very far in the past. But of course, it's not in the past. But I'm sure I'm curious you know, responding to that mentality, do you think it's still, a, imperialism is still a relevant framework for seeing the world? Uh, yes, I think um, it, it definitely is. So long as, um, I think a lot of the confusion within in international relations scholarship comes from uh, not having a consensus or an understanding of what actually imperialism is, right? So I think for many people, when they think about imperialism, they'll think about the Roman Empire, or they'll think about empires of the past, they'll think about uh, really direct uh, forms of, in which more stronger states deny sovereignty to weaker states, right? But we are, we are living in an era for the past two, some would say five centuries of a capitalist world system, right? So to understand imperialism is to understand how there's a specific form of imperialism that arises out of the capitalist world system. And here, I think I follow and uh, for those who would have heard me speak before, I'm probably sounding like a broken record right now, but I follow, I think, somebody more like Samir Amin, uh, who, you know, was very much influenced by Lenin, but, you know, he responds to Lenin's theory of imperialism by saying Lenin, what he got wrong was that capitalism was imperialist from its foundations. It wasn't a higher stage. And so there's a way in which uh, imperialism is tied to the specific economic system of capitalism. It cannot function without imperialism, right? And so when we think about imperialism in relation to capitalism, now it's not simply a territorial logic of power, that right? it is no longer simply seizing control, direct control over the resources of another state, over the sovereignty of another state. It can happen indirectly, right? In ways that are not so clearly evident, which is why maybe some will say that, well, uh, we live in an era where imperialism is no longer relevant, right? And uh, I know you had somebody on your show, I think, some time back, Prabhat Patnaik, who I'm mm -hmm. also very influenced by. And I think he wrote the famous essay in the 90s, Whatever Happened to Imperialism, as an analytical framework, right? And so I think what we have to keep in mind is that in, a, in the capitalist system, imperialism is really premised upon control over economic capital, over the flow of economic processes across territories. So it's less about actually establishing direct control and more about establishing control over the capital that flows across all territories and in establishing monopoly control over capital, then you render states, which might seem to be formally independent, you render them dependent upon your monopoly control over economic capital, right? And I think if we look at imperialism in that register, and again, this is something that has been fundamental to capitalism because that control over economic capital uh, has enabled a transfer of surplus wealth, surplus labor value from periphery to core, right? From the 
peripheral countries to the core for the history of capitalism. And this is something that uh, without which, you know, uh, the core capitalist countries, their economies couldn't function, which, uh, you know, I could say more about that, but I would also say for, for your, for your uh, viewers, uh, the Patnaik's recent book on capital and imperialism really uh, outlines that in, in greater detail. So I think that's maybe why there's confusion, but I think, uh, you know, we're just coming out of, or we're still in, uh, this era of neoliberalism, which was fundamentally premised upon uh, uh, reproducing and intensifying the dependence of many states in the third world and the developing world upon uh, the monopoly control over economic capital exercised uh, by the North. So, yeah, I think it's uh, it's central and pivotal to understanding both the capitalist world system and the challenges that have arisen to this system today. So. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, one way I think for like the sort of layman's person, um, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one way I think to look at imperialism that can be useful is it's the way like capitalism is organized internationally yeah. um, under the control of, of course, like the United States and Europe, basically. Um, but yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's really important to note. And obviously for most listeners and viewers of this show, I don't we don't have to convince them that imperialism exists yeah. um, or that the U.S. is an imperialist country. But it is interesting how it's like among mainstream, like among mainstream academics, it is like a topic of controversy. And then you'll have and then This is like a good segue into another thing I wanted to ask you about, which is China, because you'll often hear these same sorts of people talk about China as some sort of imperialist power. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious uh, in respect with respect to China, like how does China fit into this? First of all, does China, do you think, offer an alternative model to the global South? Or is it impossible to repeat its success elsewhere? And I guess let's talk about that before we get into whether or not China is an imperialist power, which I think we both agree it's not. But, but yeah, do you think it can be replicated, the sort of Chinese model of development? Even many um, who are involved in South-South relations from a Chinese perspective would be hesitant to say, look, we're seeking to advance a Chinese model. But I think there are lessons that can be learned for sure, right? And I think like um, there are things around the way in which uh, China is quite singular in the level to which it actually overcame the dependent conditions that most uh, states confronted when they achieved formal independence from uh, imperialist and colonial powers, right? When China becomes independent in 1949, it actually undertakes a radical uh, program of land reform, of land redistribution, um, of, of nationalization, which enables China to actually um, produce forms of capital accumulation, or uh, I think what, the, what Mao referred to as labor accumulation, right? So to generate surpluses through intensive mobilization of labor on a collective basis, right? And then to recycle those surpluses at the township and village level to build up industry uh, from a local scale. And so you see what China did, and it's quite remarkable, right? From 1949 till today, it has addressed uh, its uh, uh, deficits in infrastructure. It has addressed issues around poverty, around hunger. Um, it has built a, an integrated kind of national economy um, without actually engaging in a process of underdeveloping other parts of the world. So you know the West, the Western path of development is a path that is fundamentally premised upon a dialectic of development and underdevelopment. Now for all of those, and we can talk about why I, I fundamentally would disagree with anybody who would call China imperialist, um, like just point to where there is a relationship of development and underdevelopment, right? So China, through mass mobilization of labor, overcame, so look, if I can just back up a second, what is the difference between the Chinese and the Western path, right? Um, the Western path was built upon the dispossession of labor, right? And so there's a contradiction that Patnaik's point to in their book, which is really important to emphasize, that uh, since labor is entirely dispossessed from land and from the means of production in, in its entirety, um, it, it, it requires a colonial subsidy to subsidize that labor, right? Because there's that, that labor cannot reproduce itself outside of the market, right? And so if capital wants to repress the costs of labor, right, um, uh, to, to uh, achieve profits, well, it's going to actually end up exhausting and destroying that labor supply unless it can give that labor supply access to cheap food, cheap clothing, which is coming from the colonies, right? Now, China didn't build its development path on the basis of an external surplus drain, 
right? It was through an intensive mobilization of labor, which was built in the first case upon the radical redistribution of land, right? Uh, which happens elsewhere, of course, right? It wasn't China the only place, but it doesn't happen as radically and as deep as it does in China. So I think the labor-centered path in China does provide uh, an alternative route for other global South states. And I think um, the, the, the way in which the state remained at the helm of the development project in China, the way in which the state remained uh, at, at control of what was referred to the commanding heights of the economy, right? How it hasn't uh, relinquished capital controls, currency controls. Um, so it can still play a directive management role over the whole national economy. I think this is something that there, there are lessons that can be drawn, right? So I think there is definitely uh, something that I think states do look to uh, uh, China, because why, why does China have such a radically different experience in the 1980s and 1990s than Latin America and uh, much of the African continent, right? There's a different structural basis from which China engages uh, the world market. No, that's a really good point. And, and, you know, in some ways, like, I think a lot of the time, this is a point I've actually seen you make on Twitter. Um, but in a way, it seems like Westerners, when they talk about China as an imperialist power, they talk often about like Hong Kong and Taiwan, which are actually parts of China, which were in fact colonized, not by China, by outside powers. But in a way, it seems like a lot of times they're kind of projecting European colonialism and that experience of being like a, from a European colonizing country onto China with regard to places like Hong Kong and Taiwan? Yeah, I think without question, there's a, there's a, a projection that is occurring. Uh, there's also um, a heavy dose of Orientalism uh, that is occurring as well. Because I think one thing that we should always add to this conversation, right, to understand the quote unquote new Cold War or the West-China rivalry, uh, you know, and I've made this point before, but there is now rightfully a lot of recognition amongst critical academics, amongst social movements, that capitalism, a capitalist world system is fundamentally built on anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, right? But what is often forgotten and not sufficiently recognized is the role that the subjugation of China played in the rise of mm -hmm. Europe, right? In the, in the 19th century, it is, it, 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 you know, the, one can make an argument, the triangular trade, trade, of course, right? The, the triangular, I guess, colonial process between Britain, England, and and uh, sorry, uh, the UK, India, and China uh, was fundamental, right, to the surplus drain through which uh, the UK was then able to subsidize the industrialization of the rest of Europe and the United States, right? And so uh, China's, the subjugation of China, the drain of surplus value that left China as one of, if not the poorest, hungriest country in the world in 1949, that is, that is often left out of a lot of these conversations, right? And actually the role that Hong Kong played, <laughs> you know, as a port um, in For maintaining... OPM. Yeah, uh, and 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 uh, forcing through which, you know, the the West was able to control the flow of economic capital into and out of China, right? In a way that diminished Chinese sovereignty. So that question of how China has stood up in response to it's not like the West and China both colonized one another. The West actually <laughs> subjugated China. It 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 placed China. Uh, in a subordinate, subservient role in its rise, right? And so China, I think its, uh, its whole modus operandi of the past 70 years has been to restore its sovereign capacity. What can it do to build a uh, form of economic production, right, where they can, it can maintain independence so it doesn't reproduce the century of humiliation, right? But it's quite, I find it quite striking that in so many of these discussions, that history is left out. Right, that history yeah. of what is informing China's engagement in international relations and world. Why, why, why do we assume that the 19th century colonization in the Americas, that what happens uh, with uh, enslavement and the uh, African descendants and Black Americans, that this continues to have consequences and significance today? But the the historical relations between the West and, and China are are always underplayed, right? And I think that's a big part of the. Uh, not only is there a projection, right, like how you mentioned that China is um, like uh, Europe or the West, even though it has no history of doing that, um, I think there's also a desire to once again subjugate China, right? Because, 100%, because yeah. China's rise actually more so than any other process. And if you're a decolonial, anti-imperial, anti-colonial thinker or activist or whatever, you know, 
It should be recognized that it's China's rise that has more than any other process called into question the material capacity of the West to continue to draw a surplus from the non-Western world into Western capitals. Exactly. I mean, yes, the rise of China is this many ways, in many ways, it's a consequence of the decline of the U.S. and the West, but it's also a reminder of it in so many ways, um, which I'm sure like is like really triggering for yeah. many American and European imperialists. And, you know, just moving on to the to another topic that's related to China and the Cold War is, of course, Russia and Ukraine. And I'm curious, you know, in the context of imperialism, well, first of all, let me put it this way. Do you think the conflict in Ukraine has expedited that Western decline that we were talking about? And then I can go to like the other questions I want to ask you about that. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I mean, again, it's hard, it's hard to always to keep up with things in real time. Like, I, and I, I, I know in the age of Twitter and everything, you know, you'll see somebody who, you, who, has, who has immense authority who will proclaim, well, this is what's happening. Uh, as a result of sanctions, they're, they're, you know, you, you read one source and it'll say Russia's crumbling. Another source will say, well, it's the West that it's. But I, I from from what one one can see, yeah, it is expediting <laughs> the decline, right? And this is like a, the contradiction of Western imperialism today. Is it seems to be digging its own grave, right? It seems to be, uh, to to paraphrase Lenin in, in this way, right? It's, it it really seems to be uh, ex- expediting its own decline, right? It's just. Uh, or, or there was an anticipation that maybe Russia itself had been anticipating uh, an escalation of sanctions and had put in place measures to counteract this, right? Or that maybe the rest of the world outside of Europe and North America um, had advanced and had built up uh, forms of economic power and economic resiliency and resourcefulness uh, that would render Western sanctions much less impactful, right? And would actually rebound back on the West, right? And I think, um, you know, I just had a conversation with some people about sanctions uh, on the Developing Economics blog. And uh, I think one point that Max, Max made in the conversation was um, that, you know, if you're going to end up sanctioning more than half the world, then, you know, the sanctions are going to end up being quite limited in their, in their effect. So, I, yeah, I guess, I, I, yes, I do think it's expediting... Uh, the decline of the West or the crisis of Western imperialism uh, as countries are forced or motivated now to construct alternative architectures around, you know, currency, around trade and and, and financing. Yeah, it's amazing, though. It's like, what made, why, just from like the perspective of logic, why would you think you can sanction literally every major oil producing country except like maybe Saudi Arabia? I mean, Iran, Venezuela, now Russia. And that's not going to have like a ricochet effect around the world and come back to hit you hard. I mean, you look at Europe, like planning to ration, talking about power cuts in the wintertime, which they're totally okay with. At least European leaders are because like they don't care. (laughs) They actually don't care, you know, anything to please American empire. And then, I mean, you have just like oil prices out of control. And you even I think at one point, like when the sanctions on Russia began, you had the U.S. trying to replace it. I think it was just like 5% or maybe less of American uh, gas or oil or energy came from Russia. So it's not like a huge amount, but even then they were trying to replace it with Venezuelan oil. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just like, I don't know. Just the logic, that makes no sense to me uh, yeah. that you think you can do that. You can sanction all the countries that have the resources and then think that like life is going to work out in your favor. Mm-hmm. But anyways, but I think I mean, sorry. I think I think the U.S. is making uh, Europe pay that cost. I think yes, that that's there's, true. I think we'll see more discussion coming about maybe uh, the United States is is I think equipped to weather this much better than Europe is. Yeah, so. for sure. No, no, of course. Like I said, like five percent. I mean, more the the effect the U.S. has to deal with is rising oil prices affect the pump, right? So it's more of yeah. like a domestic political concern in the U.S. because it's like going to be blamed on the president if gas prices go up. But that said, yeah, it's Europe that's dealing. I mean, it's biggest gas, the, the country it exports the majority of its gas from. It's sanctioning and then it's crying like, oh my God, Russia's trying to hurt us. Uh, what did you expect them to do in response? Like, it makes no sense. Yeah. But, you know, in terms of, of course, the war in Ukraine, like, how do you place the Russian offensive in Ukraine in the context of an anti-imperialist worldview? Because I think that this has really been one of the more difficult things for 
leftists in the West to, like, contend with because Russia did invade Ukraine. And we know that, of course, like, NATO is at fault for provoking it. But at the same time, you basically, like, these Western imperialists are then able to go and make this argument that Russia's an imperialist power. So maybe I should ask the question that way. Like, do you think Russia's an imperialist power? And I don't think you think so, and I don't think so either, so why not? <laughs> yeah, so, that, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a question I think I'm... Um like I would be because I have I have looked into you know uh, let's say Eastern Europe or Russia uh, maybe less so a lot of my work centers on a comparison of China and India but I think like I don't in the way we discussed imperialism in the opening right as um, as as a cap capitalist imperialism involving a control uh, or a monopolization over the flow of economic capital right and a rendering dependent uh, uh, other states upon that I don't see Russia as definitely uh, um, like satisfying that sort of definition uh, of right. imperialism right now. I think somebody could look and say like, look, what Russia is doing might suggest a more traditional imperialism, like non-capitalist, right? Like, look, it's going and it's imposing its will, but I think it's complicated, right? Uh, the, uh, again, um, not, not wanting to claim expertise on the region, but I think, you know, one thing that I find striking is, okay, Yes, one can have a discussion, is Russia engaging in a denial of Ukrainian sovereignty, right? And, uh, you know, my, a lot of my research really centers this question of the denial of sovereignty as actually a key part of the capitalist world system because it allows this surplus uh, flow, right, from periphery to core. But in many ways, Russia is also responding to a earlier denial of sovereignty, right? Like, right. So, like what happens in 2014, right? The, so... Um, and, you know, there shouldn't be it's, it's quite it's quite striking the censorship that has come around this issue that, you know, to even ask the question. Right. Is that like what happened in 2014? Like the Yanukovych government is a, I guess, nominally pro-Russian government. Right. But even Yanukovych, uh, the government had clearly indicated preferences to join the European Union. It, it, it had kept that door open. But at one point, uh, clearly are upset and not happy with the terms being offered, right, by the European Union and the IMF, right, in terms um, of, of how Ukraine would integrate. In, in, in just a classical... Hey, so, uh, just, some, might, some might call it a debt trap. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but, I mean, so it was like, a, of course, you know, there's, there's like the classical IMF set of demands, yeah. right? Okay, we will float you or we will loan you uh, a certain amount of funds, but you have to cut your pensions. You have to yes. um, you have to uh, engage, undertake Call austerity. Out, like the entire public sector, basically. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and of course, this is something that was a big part of the collapse of the Soviet um, space, right? The, the aggressive privatization. And even in 2014, the IMF and the, the IFIs did not feel that this task had been done sufficiently, right? They wanted to complete the wholesale privatization of, of, say, like a state like Ukraine, right? So then when the Yanukovych government rejects this and turns uh, and, and is ready to sign a deal with Russia, how is that not then a form of sovereignty? Why is that not a form of sovereign expression, right? So if you look at what we are supposed to assume is that that moment is a moment of despotism. Yanukovych is reduced then to a Russian puppet, right? And the only authentic Ukrainian expression can be that which aligns with Western objectives, right? And exactly. that's the same thing in Libya, the same thing in Syria, every single case, right? The agency and the sovereignty of the people always coincidentally lines up <laughs> with the West and the, desp the despotic moment is always that which is uh, challenging. And so I think like in, man in many ways, you know, when, when one looks at what was happening since 2014, the question of Ukrainian sovereignty is much more complicated, right? Yeah. And so I think then you can, one can uh, think about Russia as being uh, both a, I guess, an offensive actor, but also a reactive and defensive actor uh, in this context in which a regime comes to power in Ukraine that is clearly uh, uh, open to uh, escalating aggression, right, in, in Donbass, but also in terms of leaving open the possibility for more missiles to be placed along Russia's borders, right? And so... Um, I think that, that that really complicates this question of, OK, it's just um, uh, unqualified Russian aggression and Russian imperialism that is motivating this process. And the one thing that I would add to that discussion is, again, um, that, uh, you know, we have to keep in mind what happened in Russia in the 1990s 
right. um, as well, right? Like it was, it's horrendous what, uh, what in many ways the West backed and advanced this process of the total, total destruction of, of uh, post-Soviet economies and, and the immiseration and starvation of people, right? So I think, you know, there, that, that, that complicates this idea that, uh, you know, one can equate, say, um, Russian action with, say, um, endless U.S. wars um, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and Vietnam and so forth, right? So. Well, yeah, like the global killing spree that the U.S. is constantly on is that it is equated to what's happening in Ukraine, as horrible as what's happening in Ukraine is. And of course, it's taking zero responsibility for the Western role in like agitating Russia. Um, and I mean, at the end of the day, like, yeah, Russia is a capitalist country that doesn't purport to be socialist or anything like that. But I mean, it had hoped to join the West, but like as an equal, not like the way Bulgaria or like Latvia did, where yeah. it's, you know, in a subordinate position. And that's why I think Russia's unacceptable to the sort of like American imperial order. Um, but, you know, I think that what's interesting also about this war, another element is how the global South has reacted because, you know, so much of the world like is refusing to get on board with sanctions against Russia. Like if you look at a map, which I wish I actually had one to show, but if you like look at the map of, of countries that are sanctioning Russia versus not, it's a minority of the world that says it just happens to be the most powerful, richest countries, the, basically the former colonial powers uh, that are sanctioning Russia. And then like Africa, the majority of Africa, the majority of Latin America and Asia are refusing to get on board with this. So I'm curious if you think it's, significant that so many countries, particularly in the global South, have refused to join this American sanctions campaign? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's absolutely significant. And I think um, it's, it's, not, it's significant in, the sense, in, in, in multiple senses. One, it is demonstrative. I think it, it provides very strong evidence that we are, to, to, I guess, answer one of your earlier questions, mm -hmm. uh, that we, or to return to one of your earlier questions, that we are actually experiencing uh, a shift to a multipolar world. Right. In the sense that how is it that so much of the global south has been able to say no <laughs> to uh, the United States and European countries who have been trying to bully them and moralize? Right. And, you know, the Financial Times has been writing editorials to be like, maybe we need to rethink the, the moral, uh, the moral voice of the developing world. Right. Because like they've proven themselves that they have no moral basis because they're not sanctioning Russia. Right. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's one question there around, OK, what is the ideological basis of the of the global south, of the position of many global south states to refuse to join these sanctions? But I think materially, it's, it reflects the fact that they're able now to say no. Right. That, that there is now um, that in comparison to an earlier era of non-aligned movement of the 50s and 60s, where there was a stronger ideological coherence, right? So at that time, you know, the, the Third World and the Soviet bloc had a stronger, let's say, ideological commitment um, to, uh, let's say, liberation and anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism, but now the material basis is stronger, right? So there's a, there's a way in which I think non-Western states, states in the Global South are able to draw on other sources, right? And even like, what is there to draw on from the West, right? Like, let's be quite frank. Like, okay, so they ha the monopoly over capital was always over the past four years of finance, finance capital going into the South and drawing out interest payments, right? Nothing that was of terrible use, right? Now you have other sources of uh, trade, investment, finance that is actually enabling more productive development, right? And so with that on the table, it's maybe easier for states not to go along with Western mm. foreign policy positions, I think that's one. I think that I think that's it's very significant for that reason. But I think for another reason, um, and this is something that I, I, I will continually emphasize. You know, it is striking how Westerners and you know the Western left or folks who claim to be um, quite committed to an anti-racist decolonization politics, how they can with a straight face talk about sanctioning Russia, how they can think that there's nothing wrong with banning Russians from playing in tennis tournaments, from banning Russian authors from being read in school, when there has been zero accountability for any of the wars that their countries, I mean, it's horrific, right? Like you still see when you'll be browsing on, on social media, you'll still see a commentary on what the United States did to Iraq, right? Or what happened in Libya. It, 
There's been absolutely no accountability, no sanctions, no reparations. So you would think if you were a Westerner, that would be your fundamental concern. Okay, if we want to talk about a just and peaceful international order, we need to first hold our states to account for what they have never stopped doing, right? Mm -hmm. And I think from a Global South perspective, that would be very evident, right? That hundreds have died in Somalia from drone strikes, right? Hundreds of civilians, families eating dinner, like where that, that might not be seen sitting in uh, the Upper West Side in New York with, the, with all the Ukrainian flags, but it's seen elsewhere in the world, right? Swat Valley, which has been subject to these horrendous floods uh, over the past uh, week, how, how, how the children of Swat Valley have been terrorized by, by, um, by drones buzzing in their skies for decades, right? So I think like if you're looking from the global south and you see how much of the world was decimated Right now, we can say the United States, but like uh, Libya, there was uh, England, uh, the UK, France, and Canada were at the forefront. Uh, Afghanistan, you know, hunting down Afghans in the uh, in the countryside. Literally. Yeah, and, like zero. And I'm I'm sorry <laughs> to keep going on on this, but it's just like no. I mean, actually, it's an endless absolutely, list. <laughs> absolutely zero zero uh, accountability. And of course, the the Palestinians in front of the whole world are continually subjected right, to being literally uh, encaged and not able to move and then subject to periodic bombardments. Like, what can be more cruel than this? And so I would ask, like, how, on what grounds could anybody with a straight face talk? Like, uh, I'm sorry, there's this economist, Adam Tooze, right, very prominent uh, economist. He ran a series of blogs in his uh, chart book newsletter, right, about Russian sanctions. And I would love to see when he will speculate on how sanctions can hold a Western country to account. He will never do that, right? You will never see any of them. Well, he would he would suffer because he would suffer. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think about this all the time because, you know, like living in Lebanon, I do visit Iraq um, every so often and I've spent some time in Syria. I mean, seeing the impact of everything you're talking about on the ground and you're right, it doesn't stop. It's ongoing. Like, it's like the U.S. has repeatedly, one country after another, sometimes many at the same time, just shatters societies in irreparable ways. Iraq is still shattered from not just the war in 2003, but like the, the, what the U.S. did in the 90s, like yeah. between the first war and sanctions. And then what the U.S. is doing now, I mean, the U.S. still operates in Iraq. It still has, you know, has like bombing campaigns and back and forth with um, with like the, what they call Iranian-backed Shia militias in Iraq, which are just Iraqis <laughs> who fought ISIS. Mm -hmm. There's like 900 American troops occupying the most fertile uh, land and most soil rich land in Syria, denying the government access to literally its own oil and wheat reserves as the country is dealing with like hunger and electricity cuts that last the majority of the day. You know, Lebanon is, I mean, <laughs> I don't even know where to start with Lebanon. G Lebanon is like everyone, you know, accuses Lebanon of being this horribly corrupt country, which is not inaccurate. But the people who crashed the economy in Lebanon are America's greatest allies, yet the U.S. blames Hezbollah and then sanctions Hezbollah and causes even more problems and is, is try, you know, helping Israel try to steal Lebanon's gas right now. Like, it's just on and on and on, like, just on the ground what yeah. I see in this very small part of the world. And, re you know, multiply that by so much. And you're right. No, So now I'm getting angry. But <laughs> well, I guess— can I but yeah, go ahead, go ahead, please. No, no, so please. I think like, I think, you know, and I, I share your, and I, I sometimes I, I worry that, you know, like it, it just turns into these angry rants, but I think we have a right to continually be angry about this because nothing's being done and it's not like it was in the past. So, you know, like the, the trick that is played now amongst, there's like a, a tendency that has emerged that silences uh, anti-imperialism, right? And I think some people have called it anti-anti-imperialism, right? Which is, yeah. it's, it's quite absurd, but like, Basically, there's a position that's like, yes, we oppose Western imperialism, but we also oppose but. other imperialism. But in every single conflict, those who voice this position will always align with the West. If you, if you think about it, right? It's only in Iraq that those who aligned with the West on Libya, on Syria, on um, uh, Afghanistan, right? On uh, uh, en endless conflicts that they have with China or with Russia, right? Every single time, every single time, those who are critical still, it's, it's worth asking, why are you every time aligning with, and what that does is it doesn't allow us to question then when the United States last week's bombed Syria, right? That has no significance. If you think about it, it doesn't even make the papers. There's no discussion. 
about what is the U.S. trying to achieve. Uh, and I can give you a little story. I was invited to give a talk um, at a very prominent uh, university in the U.S. Uh, in the spring. And I mentioned, uh, because one of the speakers was advancing this anti-anti-imperialist line, saying that the Western left lost its way uh, in Syria and so on and so forth. Right. So I mentioned the U.S. occupation of Syria that you just were referring to around uh, wheat and oil. And um, uh, I was accused of making this up, right? Like it was, a, it was, it was. Wait, was wait, a, wait, 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 what? Yeah. You so were like, accused of like fabricating that there's Americans yeah. occupying so the like, part of Syria. Okay. Right, right, right. So, uh, you know, I literally had to pull up the Cato Institute uh, kind of reports that had documented this. And, and that was actually the Cato Institute was actually much more critical than, than these uh, people who had invited me to speak. Libertarians, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they, but they, uh, you know, but you, they were, I, I was just struck that we can't even discuss the fact that they continue to occupy and strike Syria, right? Because there was no space to discuss the U.S. role in instigating war in Syria, right? If you, uh, or the U.S. role in Libya, you know, you, there was just this overwhelming narrative, yes. But every time that position uh, critiques Western imperialism, they always reduce it to something in the past. Yes. Okay, yes, yeah, I don't agree with what happened in it, but now it's different. Always in the now, it's different, right? And they end up supporting uh, that, that position. And then we are left um, ill-equipped and unable then to not even simply contest, but even recognize and name and analyze, right? Um, maybe in 20 years, we, maybe in 20 years we can... <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. But you know, you read, you read uh, uh, Bevan's work on the Jakarta method, right? And you see even the same ways in which critical voices were silenced around Libya and Syria. Those same techniques were used, right? Exactly. When the coup happens in Iran in 1953, when it's happening in Guatemala, you know, they're still silencing and being like, what are you talking about? The U.S. has nothing to do with this. This is about third world authoritarianism, right? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. But do you also think in a way like the West is kind of what's going back to the issue of so much of the global south aligning with maybe not i wouldn't say aligning so much with russia it's more like not getting on board with like the u.s side it's kind of not taking a side but sort of taking a side by not taking a side but is does this kind of demonstrate that the west is less able to impose itself on the global south and do you notice progress in the ability of resistance movements to challenge that previous unparalleled western might yeah, I think, I think, like I was saying before, this definitely demonstrates a limit, um, I think, uh, for the West to impose its will on the global south, uh, 100% without question. I think, again, what I was mentioning before, because materially, uh, there are greater alternative uh, options, right, to uh, secure um, investment finance, to continue to undertake. And, and, and a part of this, then, on the flip side is, I think many global South states would think, why would we join in on sanctions? It would have the effect of making us more dependent on the West. And this is a, uh, a block, a political economic block that clearly is going to use that dependence against us, right? It's, it clearly uh, mobilizes, uh, you know, like they seized Afghanistan's wealth. How would you know they're not going to do that <laughs> to your own state? Right. Why, would, why would any sensible statesperson in the global South render themselves more dependent on, on Western states, right? So I think like uh, there's a greater material means to resist that imposition. There's a greater recognition, right? That uh, the, the West has really little to offer, right? In terms of actual, uh, uh, say mutually beneficial relations. Um, and then I think the question of uh, resistance, like what this means uh, for resistance, I think, yes, I think like um, we are in many ways living through rising, I think, economic capacity of the, of the global south, but also the, the increase in productive capacity of many states has led to a rising military capacity, right? And I think the, the hard power question is a really key question that I know many on the left maybe don't always look at because, you know, hard power is not always pleasant to, to think through. But I think, the, I think what enables the, the rejection of lining up with the West on the question of sanctions is also grounded in more robust economic, but also productive and military capacities that obviously at China uh, is, is facilitating. In Latin America, we're seeing this, but in the, in the Middle East too, right? We're seeing how, you know, Iran obviously has suffered immensely from sanctions, but it has withstood. <laughs> it has, it has yeah. managed to not only withstand the sanctions, but to then 
continually offer resistance movements in the region uh, material support, right, with which it doesn't simply have to beg the West to take a position vis-a-vis -vis Israel. It can actually impose conditions, um, maybe minimal right now, but it, I think over the long run, we'll see that they're, they're going to increase. I mean, look, I'll tell you right now, if Hezbollah didn't exist, you would definitely have the Israelis occupying a huge chunk of South Lebanon, probably having settlements there, saying it belongs to them, mm -hmm. <laughs> biblically. And you definitely would not have the Israelis sitting down to negotiate the gas fields in the Mediterranean. They would just take it. Um, so the, that, that level of the, the existence of that kind of deterrence capacity is huge for these tiny countries. And I think, you know, just to kind of delve into that a little bit further, you've specifically th said that sanctions are less an alternative to war or a deterrent to war and more a tool of modern war. So can you explain what you mean? And do you think also that, may, you know, sanctions have become more important as the global South has proved more able to resist imperialism militarily, which is kind of built off of what you said, like having to use sanctions because Iran and, you know, Iranian allies across the Middle East are able to defend themselves. Yeah, I think I think 100 percent. And um, so like what I what I would have just written on this on the developing economics blog, I think it's um, so that's that, that the idea of uh, economics as a tool of modern war, of course, is a, is I'm taking that from the title of Nicholas uh, Mulder's book. Right. Um, but uh I think the way I was thinking about that is, um, you know, and I'm getting this from, of course, uh, Franz Fanon, uh, his his writings in Wretched of the Earth, right, where, you know, uh, people forget about this. Fanon, he theorizes violence, but he doesn't theorize it simply in the settler colony. He's theorizing violence on an international scale, right? Mm -hmm. And his whole thing is like, look, colonialism is not a game of language. It's not like we have to somehow uh, prove that we are as smart as they are and that we can speak better. No, we just basically have to confront their cannon with our cannon, right? Like we have to <laughs> confront their violence with a greater violence. He's very clear uh, with a certain political realism there, right? But then uh, I think he maps out in Wretched that like at the moment in which that greater violence can be returned, right? What the history of colonization has provisioned the West is a monopoly over economic capital, the basis of imperialism, mm -hmm. and which they got by draining surplus, right, from the third world, from the periphery. So now they control and they can then undertake a capital strike. They can withdraw. There can be capital flight. And then, you know, you can uh, impose conditions either through sanctions or like uh, sanctions being like, okay, uh, we're not going to allow any sort of trade or investment or financing in these economies unless they restructure, right? And yes, I think it becomes when other means have failed, this becomes... Uh, and it's a it's a structural uh, feature, I think, of the imperial capitalist world system, right? Is that when the means of violence uh, are no longer um, can no longer be deployed uh, in the same way, then uh, finance capital, I think, emerges as as the as the uh, preferred instrument of subjugating um, the the colonies or the ex colonies now right in in what Kwame Nkrumah would call neo colonial guys right so I think it is it's a it's a tool of modern war that Nicholas Mulder called it I I, I called it in the in the piece a tool of um, like a counter revolutionary colonial restoration right because it's uh, a, it's, yeah. it's 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 forged in response to anti colonial revolution right so it's counter revolutionary and I think um, you know after the Iranian Revolution. Uh, it's very clear you're not going to now go in uh, or do you have the means to militarily subjugate an Iran, right? Um, do you have the means to sustainably military subjugate a Venezuela, right? Like uh, uh, China today, clearly not, right? I don't think there, oh, yeah. there's any way they could, they <laughs> yeah. could imagine that, right? But so I think, um, or the, let's look at Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Right. What what so what function? What yeah, function? they tried. They tried. They tried really yeah. hard <laughs> and yeah, yeah. So, with, with violence. Yeah, yeah, and failed. So it is. It is. It is. I think uh, one has to be very clear. Sanctions are not an innocent, neutral objective of achieving international peace and stability uh, through nonviolent yeah. means. Right? It is. It is a means of war uh, that has yeah, really choose. serious consequences for the people's subject to sanctions, right? I feel like people who advocate sanctions should have to, like, also go without electricity. And, like, I mean, could you imagine if, like, all those millionaire newscasters, like, couldn't get Botox anymore? 
because they had to live a life under sanction. Like they would lose their mind. Mo- like if yeah. they, you know, just the, all the things that they like, you know, internet for their live streams. Um, you know, just the basics, like it, they would lose no AC, no central heating, right. no central air. Like they would lose their minds, but they're perfectly yeah. happy imposing it on millions of people. And it causes like such mass suffering and a way that, you know, some people say that war is like actual war with fighting is not as bad because you eventually it's going to end. But with sanctions, it's like there's no end in sight. There's no future whatsoever. Um, but I wanted to shift for a moment. You know, you've also written about racial capitalism. So can you explain what that means and how it drives the planetary ecological crisis? And I know that probably seems like a huge pivot, but all of this stuff is connected. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it is. It is, I think, right? I think um, so, like, racial capitalism is a term that's usually associated with um, the work of Cedric Robinson, Right, so who who famously, I think uh, the the most famous seminal text there is uh, Black Marxism, uh, and you know the, I guess uh, to to put it in in most direct terms, uh, you know the idea of racial capitalism is that uh, race is a constituting condition of capitalism. Right, race mm-hmm. underpins the possibility uh, for capitalism to stabilize and reproduce itself. Right, and so I've I've written about this, uh, you know, in my own in my own work trying to think about. How uh, so? It, maybe maybe just to take a step back again. So it's it's how race underpins capitalism, and in my view, it's like how uh, race provides race as a let's say not simply an ideological justification, right? But race as a material relationship uh, provisions capitalism with a means of more exhaustively extracting surplus, right, from a category. Of labor, but in my work, I also try to show how race is crucial for a category of nature too, right? From which you can extract and draw surpluses without having to then reproduce uh, the the site from which the surplus is drawn. You can exhaustively draw it, and so it leads to ecological crisis. It can lead to a reproduction crisis for those who are racialized, right? So that's I think um, how I would characterize kind of racial capitalism and. Uh, yeah, in my view, it's fundamental to understanding the planetary ecological crisis, uh, the climate crisis, because if we think about, in many ways, the ecological crisis of capitalism as being driven by right, a conception of the relationship between n- nature and society, right, where very often nature is drawn down right, on the assumption that it's not productive, it is simply given, right, that it's, it's lying there awaiting productive mobilization. Right? That, that often conceals how the lands categorized as nature, as resources, ha- have actually been uh, cultivated, co-produced right, by indigenous peoples of those territories. Right? So the production of nature as a thing comes through race. Right? It comes through a conception that basically says, hey, uh, the people living on these territories have wasted these lands. Right, which 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 I guess conceals the reproductive conditions of those territories, right? And so then there's a, a process of appropriation uh, and a, an erasure and a diminishing of the reproductive conditions, which will lead to ecological collapse, right? And so what that how that relates to maybe what we're talking about is, you know, the sovereignty of uh, the third world, the sovereignty of people in developing countries, sovereignty for indigenous and black peoples in the settler colonies is really fundamental then to addressing ecological crises in multiple ways, but also uh, the climate crisis, right? Because the capacity for people to exercise uh, sovereign control over their resources, right? To, to fundamentally uh, deploy both, I guess, modern scientific knowledges, but their inherited knowledges to sustain landscapes, right, that are fundamental to their cultures and histories. I think uh, without that, we're not going to uh, be able to address the climate crisis, but a fundamental part of that is sovereign restoration. And to have this sovereign restoration, we go back to Franz Fanon, and what did he say? He said, we don't want any moral victory, right? We want what's ours. And he's talking about reparations, right? So I think racial capitalism, thinking about racial capitalism and the climate crisis and the ecological crisis, really foregrounds the imperative of climate activists today, front and center. Um, the question of rep- reparation should be on everybody's lips, right? So if you want uh, 
you know, uh, an Ethiopia, if you want a Mozambique, right, to uh, sign on to this question of how one sustainably develops, right, without undertaking what the West did, well, it's not fair to deny to others basic development so you can have overdevelopment, right? So I think a question, the question of sovereign control over resources, reparations that can allow uh, states to undertake quote unquote cleaner or more sustainable forms uh, of development are, are quite in integral, I think, going forward. And the Belt and yeah, Road no, Initiative I is interesting for that reason. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think this is like the issue of sovereignty, which is obviously something you've written a lot about, um, I think is so important here because, you know, in some ways, like I can kind of see how as the West starts to at least or has been caring more in rhetoric about climate change, how that could possibly be used to prevent like global South uh, countries from, you know, exploiting their own resources and help and using their own resources to develop. Like they've done it with Venezuela, where they'll call it petro populism, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I mean, it's fine if Chevron goes in and takes your oil, but if you start to take it yourself and then use it to finance like social programs, that's a really big problem. But I wanted to talk about the issue of sovereignty because in a sense of like, we, we do talk about it a lot, but can you very briefly explain like, what is sovereignty? Who has it? Or maybe I should say, who is allowed to have it? Because when countries in the global South, as you've said before, try to establish conditions for sovereignty, suddenly they're like authoritarian or they're despotic and they have to be sanctioned. And then, you know, sovereign, like, they, and they're denied sovereign recognition by colonial powers. It's almost like their sovereignty doesn't exist. Like the colonial, former colonial powers, the imperialist powers decide, get to decide who gets to have sovereignty and who doesn't. So Syria, literally the argument made by Western powers about Syria was that Syria has literally, because of its criminal acts, has basically given up its sovereignty and it's no longer a sovereign country. Yeah. But at the same time, if a poor country in the global South abides by these rules of how their country and economy have to be, the rules that are imposed on them by the West, then they get like some sovereignty, at least maybe for their elites a little bit. And I think a, maybe a good example of this is Palestine in some ways, because you have a situation with the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank versus the situation in Gaza with Hamas. And that's a very different uh, level of control and access to the world that these two places are given. Yeah, I think I think that's this is uh, in, in my view like this is the fundamental question, right? And I think like um, I, I was on um, the East is a podcast last year, and I was talking to Sina about exactly what you're talking about this microcosm, right? Between how um, how Gaza and the West Bank actually do represent uh, what a microcosm between what we might say, which is the bind that many uh, say global South third world states find themselves in, right? Is that you can go the way of getting recognition, right? So you're saying there's no recognition accorded to Syria. So the West Bank, like the Palestinian Authority can get recognition, but they're not left with actual sovereignty, right? So like uh, it's a, it, we can say that's a quasi sovereignty and we can say in Gaza, you know, uh, Hamas and the authorities in Gaza have not sought to compromise in ways that will, although they have at times also <laughs> Shown an yeah. op openness to compromise, but it's rejected because it's just still not enough, right? Uh, but they're they're then uh, sanctioned and hemmed in, right? And so their sovereignty is diminished in other ways, right? In in terms of that they're because of sanctions, they cannot undertake political and economic exchange in ways they might otherwise do so. So this is a bind, I think that that is fine. Now sovereignty, like what is sovereignty? Sovereignty is in many ways. You know, like there's two components to it, right? It's, it's establishing, it's, it's, the, it's the authority over a bounded territory, right? So like it's to, to be sovereign is to be the clear uh, authority that can uh, impose will over an entire territory, right? So the sovereignty of a people is to say the right of a people, right? Over their resources and over their territory. We can say over their labor, over uh, the economic capital, that flows through the territory, right? So the, that, and then a second component of sovereignty, right, is recognition, right, that other sovereigns will recognize you as sovereign, right? Now, the I think the well, the point that I will often bring up is that, um, and I and I mention his book all the time, but I think it's a really important book by Anthony Engie. It's called um, I think uh, anyhow I think people can look it up. Engie A N G H I E. 
I think it's imperialism, sovereignty, and international law, right? Where essentially uh, Engie demonstrates from the 16th century till today, right? That international law was founded in this question that you posed, right? This question of who can be sovereign, right? And it was it was really really racialized, right? So what Engie demonstrates is that the founding theorists of international law, uh, specifically think about Francisco de Vitoria, but then thinking about how Vitoria influences the work of somebody like Hugo Grotius. Um, that uh, that for Victoria, just to be very brief about it, that the that the Spanish, right at the time, they had the right to engage in endless war against the indigenous people of the Americas, or to sanction them at the moment in which indigenous people deny the Spanish their right to commerce and their to their right to trade. Now, what is the trade? It's colonization. So, right, so think about this. Now, what states, why, how does this rule, so you know when Blinken talks about his rules-based order, this is what I try to argue, this is the rule, right, is what states have been subject to sanctioning? Those states that have denied the West this right to commerce, which is basically through programs like nationalization, through land reform, right, which would actually give you a strong basis of sovereignty because it would allow you to produce and control economic surplus that would allow you to overcome dependency, right? So now you have an actual sovereign basis, but whenever states have attempted to implement those sorts of programs, they've been subject to sanctions. And I think a really excellent example is what happens in China in 1949, right? Who does the West recognize as sovereign? The Republic of China. Taiwan, right? Taiwan, but, Taiwan. But, yeah. it becomes, but that, that's actually China, right? And that's I think the funny thing that I think uh, all of these folks now who are so concerned about Taiwanese sovereignty, like, okay, your position tails the position of Western states constantly, right? Because like yeah. earlier the position was Taiwan is China. And now it's, uh, now it's like, okay, no, 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 it's not. It's its own thing, right? But Taiwan is recognized as sovereign and China is not. Why? China, the first, what's the first act of the People's Republic of China, right? It abrogates the uneven treaties that the West had imposed on China, right? It starts to undertake nationalization of foreign firms uh, aggressively, right? And so like, there's a way in which, why is the People's Republic of China denied sovereign recognition at the moment where ROC is given sovereign recognition? Then of course, across the 70s, 80s, and 90s, it seems as though the West thinks China is actually willing to subordinate itself and integrate itself. But by the 2010s, when it's clear that's not the case, again, there's a questioning of, is, is this, uh, the, the, the authorities in China, can we recognize them as adequate sovereigns, right? No, we can't because they're not playing by the rules of the game, right? Their state is too powerful in the economy, uh, debt traps and so forth, right? And I think uh, beyond that, I think if you look at the states that are sanctioned, right? Look at Democratic People's Republic of Korea, look at Venezuela, uh, look at Zimbabwe, right? Let's look at Cuba, uh, uh, Iran. Now, of course, these states have their internal contradictions. Of course, these states, nobody would claim that there's no problem, that there's no need for movements and organized force on the ground to continue to engage these projects to ensure uh, that they are more respect uh, uh, embodied a, of a sovereign popular will, right, of the workers and peasants of these countries. But there are other states that have even more severe contradictions. Like, you know, you mentioned Saudi, you can think about the United States itself, right? Like, so what is it about these states that subjects them to sanctions, right? And again, I, I, I often invite people to just investigate that question, right? Even, you know, we don't even have to say, but why, why is China subject to such hostility and not India, right? Why is Zimbabwe subject to sanctions and not South Africa, right? Oh, well, is there a difference between how South Africa has approached the question of land since uh, the 2000s versus <laughs> Zimbabwe? Does Zimbabwe redistribute land. What is the difference between a Venezuela and a Brazil, right? Like why, why is one subject to sanctions and why not? Is Venezuela really that much more uh, worse on the conditions people claim than, than Brazil is? Or is there, is Venezuela actually, has it tried to construct the foundations through nationalizing control, through collectivizing control, through undertaking forms of land reform? Right. Uh, and again, I, I don't want people to get it twisted or mistaken. None of this should be taken to say like, OK, uh, this means that there are no problems. Of course, there's contradictions. But I, I would agree very much that who can be sovereign, right, is uh, states that don't challenge 
that founding rule of a Western-dominated imperial capitalist system, right, of the right of Western capital to maintain first access to the resources uh, of the global south. No, absolutely. That's so well said, and it's not, like, understood enough, or maybe it's willfully, like, not understood. But talking about, you know, you mentioned reparations earlier. Um, and it's always interesting, because we talk about people denying atrocities taking place now in all of these different forms that we've talked about. But there is this, like... Like the New York Times recently had this piece on Haiti, and I know that you you have tweeted about this, and I, yeah. it was so interesting because it was a very good piece. The piece on on Haiti taught like it basically delved into how much Haiti was forced to pay the French as you know quote unquote reparations for kicking out French slave owners violently, mm. um, and. Then, you, like, and and the number was astounding. It was like, you know, I, I can't remember what the number was. It was billion, but it was a crazy amount of money that Haiti, over like a hundred years, has been forced to pay back to the French, which is completely outrageous. And that's not to mention the ongoing uh, destruction of Haiti by U.S. imperialism and, and which so wasn't on. in the article. <laughs> which was not in the article. Yeah, like as if today yeah. nothing's happened. Like as if there hasn't yeah. been several. U.S. backed coups, the lowering of labor standards, the lowering, making sure that the minimum wage isn't raised. Thank you, Hillary and Bill Clinton. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, you could, we could, we needed, like, that would take up a whole episode just to talk about what the U.S. has done to Haiti in just the last 20 years. Um, but, anyways, it's just, it is this like weird formula where you do see liberals specifically being okay with talking about certain horrible things that Western countries did a hundred years ago, but then they ignore, and this is actually what you tweeted, you, you, or I don't know if you tweeted this or you retweeted somebody saying this, but I have to actually repeat it because it's just okay. so well phrased. Wait until you learn that in the last 20 years, the West sanctioned Zimbabwe for reclaiming land from colonizers. And last year, Zimbabwe, in order to gain access to international credit, was forced to pay back the colonizers for lost property. I didn't know that happened. Yeah. And I mean, that's also, and you can, you can elaborate a little bit on that, but like you mentioned also the looting of Afghanistan's like central bank assets, which is literally causing mass starvation in Afghanistan right now. And we see articles about that, that like don't mention the fact that Joe Biden is denying Afghanistan their money. <laughs> and even like nine, who tried to give it to 9-11 families who were like, we actually don't want this money. Please give it back to the people of Afghanistan. You have the UK like stealing billions of dollars in Venezuela's gold, and it's like totally normal and okay. Um, you've Iranian oil is literally on a regular basis confiscated by the US and then sold for profit by the United States government on a yeah. regular basis. So, anyways, if you just wanted to address that. Yeah. Bizarre, like, oh, 100 years ago, but shh, not today. Yeah, so I, th I, I th well, I think that's, there's several things there, right? Like, I think um, I tweeted something else, like, a little bit after that was, like, there's a, there's, a, there's a temporality, there's a time of Western imperialism where it's never today. It's always in the past, <laughs> right? And so even people like uh, Justin Trudeau in Canada will always be like, yeah, we're so sorry, you know, but it's always, it happened. And now we're trying to fix it, right? So it's like something, it's always in the past. And it's a part of the, the role that this ideology of linear progress plays in kind of Western capitalist modernity, right? That we are the force that improves upon the past and brings progress to the future, right? But the time of the now is always obscured, right? It's always a thing that, uh, okay, that happened then, but, and it, and it kind of, you know, can, it can relate back to this white man's burden notion that, yes, it was bad that happened, but everything happened and has been improved upon, right? Now, the Haiti thing is really significant. Uh, I, you know, you, we could have a whole episode, I think you're right. One thing that I found, if I can just say, really uh, interesting about the Twitter debate that happened around Haiti is that all these academics who were mad at the Times being like, look, we also have been writing about reparations and we weren't recognized. Okay. Fair enough, right? But shouldn't the anger have more been that there was nothing in the piece about the coup that happens against Aristide? It's not simply because he demands reparations, because he's actually trying to put in place conditions for Haitian sovereignty. You know, talking about nationalization of Haitian mineral wealth, you know, the increasing of the Haitian minimum wage, that was nowhere in the discussion. So that again, we can talk about Haiti in the past, but not Haiti today. And like the looting of resources of uh, Afghanistan, of uh, Iran, of Venezuela, Right? And if we think about 
the neoliberal era of the 80s and 90s. It was just straight looting, right? Like you just had uh, finance capital going in and just taking out interest payments from so many countries. And this is a core part of capitalism, right? Is a, we think about accumulation as coming through production and exploitation, but there's also primitive accumulation, which is just straightforward taking, right? And we forget that there's a trick that Western capitalism has played where it often projects itself as having arrived at more productivity and efficiency, but it conceals how so much of that wealth is simply taking, right? And so the taking of wealth from Iran, from Venezuela, Afghanistan, right? It's in peace with that, in, in line with that. Um, and I think like the, the, uh, the question of uh, reparations in another way that, uh, another point I think that's very significant that you brought up is that it's always the slave owner and the colonizer who receives reparations, right? And I don't think we can call yeah. those reparations, but whenever like, you know, uh, Haiti, France receives reparations, right? In the US South, for a brief period, you know, um, uh, black Americans, black people in the U.S. are given land, but it's taken away, right? Uh, repeatedly uh, over the 19th and 20th centuries. And in fact, former plantation owners are the ones who are given access to capital, access to reparations, right? This happens everywhere. And so this is a rule as well, right? And in Zimbabwe, you had actually a process of land redistribution in the early 2000s. We talk about land back. This actually happens in Zimbabwe. Right where, and the backstory of this is that in the you know 1980s when Zimbabwe gets independence, and then when when uh, South African when apartheid formally ends, right? Although economic apartheid continues uh, in South Africa, which should be a very significant lesson I think for the BDS movement in Palestine. But that's a different conversation. But the the in both cases, you know, there's pressure on the Zimbabwe, the newly formed Zimbabwe state, and in South Africa to protect the property rights. Right of settlers, right? So, okay, you're free, but in the constitution, there should be an article where property uh, is, is, is rendered uh, basically untouchable, right? And so the British had told Zimbabwe, listen, we'll finance land transfer, right? Don't go and take land, you know, because the third world rallying call in decolonization was land back, right? Land without comp compensation. We just want our land back um, and we don't need to compensate the colonizer. So for 20 years in Zimbabwe, uh, there's no land redistributed. And then the British say in the late 90s, like, we're not gonna actually pay for this, sorry. It's not our responsibility. And then by that point, the government in Zimbabwe has to respond to the demand of from below movements that are seizing land from white farmers, right? So they actually undertake serious land redistribution, which subjects them to sanctions immediately, you know, in the <laughs> early 2000s. So much racist rhetoric was uh, circulated at the time right around the incapacity of Zimbabweans to take over the land held by white settler farmers, right? And so land is taken, it's redistributed. There's a lot of challenges because of the sanctions, right? It's not to say that, but there were gains. There have studies that have come out that have shown that small farmers did benefit in Zimbabwe, right? Uh, the, the leader of La Via Campesina today, Elizabeth Mpofu, is a beneficiary of Zimbabwe's land reform process. But just last year, uh, Zimbabwe had to pay back the settler farmers in order to ease some of the sanctions, right, that have been imposed on it. And so that is the rule, it seems. Reparation, no reparations were given to Zimbabwe. No reparations were given to Zimbabwean farmers who received land in the 2000s. The Western countries didn't say, hey, you know, we're going to give you a whole bunch of reparations to enable you to access capital so you can increase the productivity of your agriculture. No, right? They were instead sanctioned and it was made more difficult. And I think that is a repeated pattern, a rule almost of the Western dominated international system, right? Is to impose sanctions on those who would dare reclaim resources and nationalize and to give reparations to colonizers, right? Who have, and oftentimes in the reparations are financed through neo-colonialism, right? Through the seizing of wealth from an Afghanistan, from an Iran, from a Venezuela. Exactly. And, um, you know, I want to shift for a moment to talking about like internal contradictions. I just a couple more questions here because I know I've taken a lot of your time. But, you know, I there's something that I, I think gets left out of all these conversations, which you alluded to, is we talk so much about the agency of all these people in adversary countries. Of course, it's only ever like the agency of the ones who like happen to be pro-Western. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to agency, I think, uh, you know, some of the most powerful, powerless people on 
earth when it comes to like having power over their government, ironically, are actually Americans, U.S. like U.S. citizens. You know, there was even this Princeton study that I'm sure you know about. A lot of people saw from years back that actually like looked at policy in the U.S. and compared it to voter preferences and found that the average voter has like no actual say over American policy, where it, the U.S. is actually it functions like an oligarchy where government is owned by corporations, and they're the ones who get to uh, actually produce policy. And you recently tweeted, and this actually really spoke to me because, you know, I living outside of the U.S., when I go back to visit my family, like, this becomes even more stark for me uh, because I see the difference. You, you really do see the difference when you're outside of the country versus when you're in it. You, you tweeted, life has no value in America. The society has shown time and again. It has no capacity to turn around and look at itself for what it is. A disempowered, confused populace with no means to affect change while its leaders crow about defending democracy. This is not a new phenomenon, of course, but the contradictions of U.S. imperialism have reached such proportions that it should be clear that what we're facing is either a direct confrontation with the dictatorial rule of capital or an intensification of fascism and imperialism. And so to that, I actually want to ask you when it comes to that issue that you mentioned of fascism, you know, there's like this great deal of concern in the West today about the rise of fascism. Um, do you think that this sort of like decline of the West is actually going to feed into the rise of fascism? Because that's sort of what happens when capital is desperate. Yeah, I think I, think I would definitely... Um... I think I, I agree with that in many ways, right? I'd, I'd say one qualification I would put is that, you know, uh, in the United States, but also, uh, you know, I'm from Canada originally, in Canada as well, right? Like the, the there's always been fascistic uh, elements of these states that have never stopped, right? Like how, what is the political framework to which we would make sense of, right? Uh, the, the fact that, uh, the the incarceration rate of Black Americans, right? Like, what is what is and and the fact that there is uh, forced labor that occurs through this mass incarceration, right? Okay, is a, if we saw that somewhere else, we might say, okay, this is a sign of some sort of um, racial project, right? That's rooted um, in some sort of fascist uh, kind of logic, right? So, like, one thing I would say is it's not that the, I don't think U.S. liberalism or liberalism elsewhere is entirely detached from, uh, mm, let's say, there's fascism. There's a line. There's at, at, a ever, line. at any point, right? But I think uh, there's a key um, argument that Greg Grandin made in a recent book called End of the Myth, and um, that uh, somebody who I'm, I'm quite keen of as a, as a theorist, Walter Benjamin, often made, um, you know, uh, that... Like the that, that 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 point that I wrote about the incapacity of Americans to turn around and look at themselves. Right? So Grandin in the end of the myth, I think he he has this uh, discussion of an election. I think between Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams, where there's a discussion around stopping expansion, right, and turning around and looking at the unjust foundations of the American state. Right? and actually interrogating and ending slavery and interrogating and ending colonization against indigenous peoples. Right? And in so doing, seeking to strike more just relations and a more just foundation of the state. Uh, but Grandin's argument is actually, this is rejected with Andrew Jackson winning the election, being a slave holder, being a, uh, someone immensely committed to colonization of, of indigenous lands. And so this is a pattern that Grandin then maps across the 19th and 20th century. Right? That the United States, rather, that the people here, because there is no capacity, right? because you're actually so politically disempowered, right? to turn around and look at who runs your society, right? that that energy is directed outwards uh, constantly. Right? And so uh, because liberalism is premised on this, this notion of um, you know, an idea of equality, right? a formal equality at least, that you confront the absence of that here in the United States. Right? Because of the rule of capital, the overwhelming rule of capital, right? a capital that is grounded in uh, wealth uh, generated from enslavement, from the theft of indigenous lands, right? but a cap also through relentless exploitation of working classes here, 
Uh, this is the capital that simply is, is uh, people do not have the capacity to confront, right? Like in any election period, right? You have basically two parties backed by capital who are unable to impose conditions. Uh, so for example, right? Like who drives wars in America? Do we have a conversation of the military industrial complex? We point to it, we reference it, but what are the actionable uh, discussions that we have around Raytheon or Lockheed Martin? Right, that just seems so far removed. Okay, no, we need to get a candidate in to office here who can speak uh, about this, but there's no material power that can stop the war industry here, right? And so in the absence of that, attention is actually directed outwards by these very forces you can't confront here, right? There's an ideological component. The energy that should be invested into overturning the rule of capital in the United States is invested into extending that rule uh, outwards, right? And I think um, that extension is so necessary. So Benjamin's argument is that because capitalism actually can't offer a future, right? That bourgeois society can't, can't give a future, right? That, to the proletarian masses, right? It, it promises a future, but it constantly fails to deliver that it then always turns back to the past, right? So mm. I think when you're saying the failure of capitalism, right? The inability to address let's say the decline in American lifespans over the past 30, 40 years, right? The absolute collapse in uh, livelihoods for many Americans, you know, the, the inability to confront that, then we can see, okay, now we have a slogan, make America great again, right? We see at this moment how, how fascism uh, is arising, right? Because the promise of the future is always uh, a deferred promise or, or it's unable uh, to be achieved, right? And that's why Benjamin, for his argument, says then the only solution is to revolutionize mm -hmm. the bourgeois proletarian relation, right? Uh, or let's say if we were to take a more global view is to revolutionize uh, or to overturn imperialism as the foundation of the U.S. state. Uh, but I think it's, it's a question that, that I think is a, it's an urgent question, whether it's climate change, right? whether it's con thinking about war, uh, economic justice, right? Is... Uh, to what extent will, I think, Americans turn around and look at, you know, the sources of power in American society, right? Especially the, the rule of finance capital, the rule of military capital. Um, yeah. And what they're doing abroad. And I think that's like a really good point to note that about liberalism, too, because obviously liberalism isn't fascism, maybe domestically, but a liberal framework is used to justify what looks a lot like fascism abroad. Mm -hmm. um, and then that can come back. I mean, it kind of reminds you like of the way, you know, with, the, with Germany, like Germany was committing all these atrocities across Africa before Nazis took over the country. And a lot of those atrocities is, is where Germany learned how to do what it ultimately did during the Holocaust, but internally and across Europe. And that's when it became unacceptable. And that's when it was like that fascist, you know, fascism turned inwards is not okay. You just got to keep it out there. Um, but I think it's also not like set in stone, of course, that like just because capitalism seems like it's failing doesn't necessarily mean there has to be a rise in fascism. And here's where I want to like kind of end on hopefully a more positive note. Um, because, you know, we talk a lot about multipolarity uh, and there's all, so many people who are opposed to the idea of multipolarity that you specifically have criticize like Western academics for actually suggesting that Western imperialism is better than multipolarity. And obviously, you know, I don't agree with that. I don't think anyone watching the show agrees with that. I, you know, I see multipolarity as something that can be very beneficial as like a tool towards a better world. But that said, multipolarity alone isn't going to get us to a better world. We do need like an ideological, you know, an alternative ideology to push for. So I guess the where I'm going here is like, Let's say Western decline takes place and China becomes like hugely powerful. We're, we're inheriting this ruined planet. There doesn't seem to be an, an alternative ideology with enough power to like limit the damage and actually push back against capitalism. And so I'm curious if you could maybe talk about an ideal world, like what could be? I know it's like a weird big question, but yeah. what could be? Like where could multipolarity get us? And what would we need to get there in terms of an ideological framework? What would an ideal world look like? Okay, so I know you want to end on a hopeful note, but I think I have to start by saying, <laughs> you even don't have when we, to, but... <laughs> well, even when we talk about ideal or idealism, yeah. we should, we must ground thinking about what could be and what is, 
We cannot yeah. overcome the world as it is, right? So, like, the reason why I bring this up is that there's a, and I, I don't, I don't mean to criticize or dismiss folks who are concerned about, say, the state, right? That people will say, look, okay, you know, and, and I get a lot of criticism from this. Um, I think, you know, people don't always tell me it directly, but it, it comes back to me that maybe like that I, I'm not critical enough of the state, right? Okay. And, and so I understand why people are. Like, I understand this, this idea, this notion of, of rejecting development, of rejecting industrialization, of rejecting modern state forms and so forth, right? That's it, it, because one would uh, hope to idealize and look towards a world in which we live more lightly on the earth, right? And people talk about these, um, I don't know, fantasies or dreams, right? Of living in self-sufficient, self-sustaining villages or small towns. But the world as it is, right, is a world that has been constructed, right? Where immense productive capacities have been risen up, right? And they are controlled by certain states to very destructive ends, right? And so I think I, in an ideal sense, right? Or not maybe an ideal sense, but but the I think the contradictions of this order, what it could give rise to, right, through multipolar multipolarity, and I agree with you, right, that there needs to be uh, a lot of contestation within the multipolar space itself, right, uh, around ecological questions, around social questions, and so forth. But you know what it can do, right, is it can allow for a reclamation of control over those productive forces, right? Like a, a, a broader distribution of sovereign control over productive capacity, over technologies, right? Over uh, technology transfers. These are, these are fundamental questions because this can then allow for regions to develop in ways in which they can reorient resources towards regional or national development, right? Which you would think would be beneficial to addressing climate change, right? To, to promote more regionalization, right? To promote forms of economic development that don't necessarily necessitate, you know, mining from the other side of the world, uh, moving things at such large distances to allow for more regional uh, dyna dynamism, right? I think in an economic sense. So I think like that sovereignty question is fundamental. I think, mm -hmm. so thinking about that, thinking about restoring uh, local national control over resources, in, an, in the world as it is, this will require industrialization, right? Like it's, it's the, it's, unless we are able to impose rapid deindustrialization upon core countries, unless we're able to de destroy those productive capacities, other states are gonna have to increase them. But I think uh, in, if a, a balanced world can allow, right, for uh, more sovereign control and direction of resort. Now, that's where I think a lot of the uh, struggles of movements grounded in ecological uh, concerns, movements grounded um, in questions of, say, uh, the sovereignty of local or regional communities over the resources. That's where they will have to do a lot of work, I think, in, in establishing kind of that world as it, as it could be, right? And I think, yeah. you know, you do see a lot of, um, I think, hopeful signs, right? I think like Look, the, the story that the, the West often tells, for example, of the African continent, right, is a, the story of the scenes that came out of the fallout of neoliberalism in the 1980s and 1990s in a miserated, impoverished country. Now, there still are so many social challenges around malnourishment, around lack of infrastructure, right? But look what happens in the 2000s, right, with increasing China-Africa trade is you yeah. have the capacity of African states to say to the IMF, like, listen, actually, we're not going to continue to deny subsidies to our farmers, right? We are going to actually start to support and try to build up our local agricultural capacity, right? So when there is uh, a drought or a drought, when there is, yeah. or there is a food price crisis, we have internal productive capacity that can weather the storm better, right? And so, you know, Malawi or Zambia, they start to undertake or reintroduce programs that the IMF had undermined earlier. Right. So I, I think, you know, we saw some evidence of that. I think we see, you know, I, I, you know, and I can I can, again, find myself in trouble with some people for saying things like this. But I I find the fact that, um, you know, the the for example, uh, a political movement uh, 
like, uh, like Hezbollah or the armed resistance uh, in Gaza, right? The fact that they continue to be able to exercise a, what is essentially a sovereign military capacity, mm-hmm. right? To, to respond to imperialism in the region. Like it or not, that, it has, that is going to be the basis of a better world, right? The, the, when, when people no longer have to continue to beg the West to stop what it's doing or to beg the West uh, for some form of aid or investment, right? The material force that underpins a changing world order, we can see it in formation, right? And now it doesn't, it's not, it's not so, I guess it's not like a dream world, right? It's not pleasant in every not ideologically, way. It's not ideologically like no, pure or, you not. know, obviously not socialist, but, yeah, yeah. you know, it would actually create the room for that to like exist in these places, in fact. And I, I think, and I think like the, the growing incapacity uh, of the West to subjugate militarily, like, uh, and even through sanctions, like the limits we're seeing will potentially provide uh, openings, right? For, I think, and here's where I would answer the question around maybe I, uh, what things could look like, right? For countries to ideally be able to marshal their resources, right? Um, in ways in which they have control over technologies through which they can develop and add value to their resources more locally. So they can retain the surplus that is generated uh, more within, you know, so this is what Samir Amin calls, um, I guess, self-centered or auto-centric development, which is different than dependent development, right? I think that is the key question, right, is how do we advance uh, that project of sovereignty? And I think there's a way in which people in the core can still fight for that, right? They can still fight uh, when uh, against sanctions, that should be like our, our number one, one of the number one rally rallying cries, cry. right? Like, yeah. like really, and the sanctions that were so cruel to the people in Iran and Venezuela during COVID, right? To even to Cuba when it goes through immense tragedies uh, over the past couple of months, right? Like that, this is a still a state that's under sanctions. So I think fighting against sanctions as a means to restore sovereign capacity to people uh, to be able to redirect resources in more sustainable. Uh, ways, I think, is a, is a key task. And then, you know, I think domestically here, thinking about movements for indigenous sovereignty and black sovereignty uh, and, you know, obviously increasingly working class solidarity, you know, we, we do see signs of this, right? But they have to be grounded in anti-imperialist politics. Um, but yeah, I know it sounds, it might sound out of place, but I, I am not unhopeful uh, of the future, if I'm, if I'm quite frank, right? I see we are living through times that are of immense confusion because the material basis of uh, Western capitalist imperialism is being called into question in a way that it hasn't before, right? And this can provide openings, I think, for, for a better, more sustainable world. Well, no, that was really well said. I love this conversation. I could actually like go on and on, but you know, um, I'll have to like have you on again. This was so seriously so (laughs) wonderful. I want to thank you for giving me an hour and a half of your time. Um, And moreover, can you like tell people where they can follow you? I'm going to go, I will link to your Twitter account and the recent piece that you, I believe, co-wrote on sanctions. If I'm not uh, it mistaken. Was, it was yeah. There was a. It was a. There was an interview, and then three of us responding right. to questions, and I think it ended up being a lot, a lot longer than was anticipated. But I think it was a very rich discussion, which touched on a lot of what we, um, we have spoken about uh, here. Yeah, and so otherwise, people can um, uh, follow me on Twitter. You can maybe look up my <laughs> Google Scholar and see the <laughs> the articles I published there, and um, I do. Hopefully, have something a, a book coming out, but I'll I'll maybe wait on uh, sharing information <laughs> on that until it's a little more uh, a little more official. <laughs> well, we'll have to we'll have you have to have you back on the show when your book does come out because yeah. and also I want to thank you for being uh, for for being like brave enough to speak out about these things in academia. I, I, it's probably can become a lonely space <laughs> at times in political science and international relations and stuff. But thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having me, Rania. I, I really enjoyed it as well. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you want to see more progressive anti-imperialist content like this, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with the latest breakthrough news content. And if you want to support our work and get access to exclusive content, head over to patreon.com slash breakthrough news.